All right. Good morning. Welcome uh, to uh, the Downtown Management Forum. We've been off for about a month. We figured over the summer we're going to uh, uh, spread, it out, spread them out a little more because everybody's hopefully having some fun in the sun. Um, today, uh, we are talking about reinventing events. And, and I think John was kidding, but I, am, I did put that he is a Downtown Excellence Award-winning <laughs> <laughs> member of DNJ uh, and president of Wildwood Bid. He'll be joining us. They're doing a lot of great events, as well as Owen Letman, uh, director of Bloomfield Center Alliance, who also kicked off uh, live events within the last month. And finally, Emily Manns from uh, EMI Strategy, uh, who's going to talk about kind of reinventing some of your pre existing live events in the virtual uh, world. Um, for those of you who don't know, Downtown New Jersey is a member-supported uh, nonprofit organization. Um, so if you're not a member, please join um, because that's what, what helps support by pulling all this educational material together. Um, you know, check out the website for all sorts of resources, particularly related to COVID resources. Um, we do an annual conference, uh, which I will put in the chat box in a little bit, a uh, survey because we're going virtual and we want your feedback on how best to do that. Um, as well as you know, quarterly uh, roundtables, Zoom webinars, et cetera, um, and an annual awards, which this year we're actually gonna push off to 2021 in hopes that we can actually do that in person um, after the new year, fingers crossed. Um, we've been doing these forums since uh, the shutdown started. Um, there are summaries and videos and PowerPoints and other resources for all of the past um, forums, so please do go check them out if you missed any of them. Uh, we haven't planned the August forum yet. If you have any ideas, feel free uh, to send my way. Um, just uh, as some of you know, I participate in the Main Street Committee of the New Jersey Restart and Recovery uh, Council. Um, and so I just, I always like to kind of, we had a meeting last week and I just like to share the latest and greatest that we hear from them. Um, so this is just some of the reopening stuff since, uh, that, that group had last met, which was about two, three weeks ago. Um, and I think most of you know it. I think the big thing, particularly for the conversation we have today, is that outdoor gatherings as of July 3rd increased to 500, but face masks are also now required when uh, everywhere, outdoor included, um, when social distancing is not possible. And I'm sure we'll have some dialogue about how good people are about the masks outside. <laughs> um, uh, also, uh, th so this survey was uh, the last two weeks of June, so at this point it's already a little dated, um, but this speaks to comfort levels with going to, you know, movies, and my little box is covering it, movies, um, indoor mall, uh, uh, beauty salon, or other self-care, uh, visiting a restaurant, so we, you know, we're still pretty low on a lot of these things. Um, and then, um, you know, most of you know, this is Americans reported they were looking for um, some significant milestones before they were going to resume, um, you know, typical activities uh, and kind of what they're looking for. You know, it's kind of a small number, 20% that's looking for just government to restrict it. It's, it's a bigger number is that there are additional requirements met. And then there's still about a quarter of people who said, until there's a vaccine, I'm not, I'm not going to engage. Um, so, so without that, without further ado, um, I'd like to, to move on. And I know Olin has an event this afternoon, so I'm going to let him go first uh, and fill the group in. And just for those of you who know, don't know, normally it's a, it's a short intro. We have three speakers. We'll go about a half an hour. Um, with the three speakers, and then we open it up, and it's a dialogue, and you can ask questions and share your own ideas, concerns, etc. So that's the way we normally run these. Uh, so out, without further ado, Olin, if you want to share what's going on in wonderful downtown Bloomfield, the host of our conference last year. Do you want me to unmute you, Olin? Uh, I got gotcha. you. Nope, I've got it. Thank you so yeah, much, Courtney. Um, yep. Good morning, everybody. It's a pleasure to, uh, to speak with you and share a little bit of the experience that we've had in Bloomfield Center. Um, I've been director uh, at BCA for about six years. Um, and like you all, the last several months have been um, something I don't think I could have scripted in, in even a horror movie. Um, and it's uh, been a learning experience, a growing experience. 
Um, but uh, Courtney invited us to, to share a little bit of what we've been trying to do uh, in terms of outdoor activities. Um, you know, obviously as May approached and we were all still in our advocacy mo uh, mode, trying to inform our business owners and property owners of resources and, and, uh, and uh, information out there that we hope would help them. We were also in the back of our minds thinking very strongly, okay, at some point we have to put together some activities. You know, um, at some point these restrictions are gonna uh, slowly but surely start lifting. And we had to make some decisions in terms of how we were to approach the outdoor season coming up in, um, in the summer. Uh, we kept very close as we all did, a close watch of what the state um, administration was doing and how they were phasing in the opening. Uh, we made some decisions, decisions in terms of canceling certain events that we felt uh, just were not controllable because of its scope, uh, its size, and, and its format, including a, a very popular uh, Washington Street block party that involved vendors and local restaurants and was just really an all-out outdoor festival. But we were able to identify a couple of opportunities that we felt we could uh, put together because it was a little bit more of a controlled environment, uh, not as uh, crowded in terms of, you know, having people walk around. And that included um, our cruise night car show, which is our uh, um, summer long or, or summer based um, outdoor car show, uh, which we call cruise nights. Uh, we like to call it, uh, you know, classic cars and cool tunes where we work with the local uh, car club um, that bring out their antique uh, um, automobiles and set them up on one of the largest streets uh, in downtown Bloomfield. And we bring in a, a local DJ to play classic tunes from the 60s and 70s. Uh, it's always been a great draw, a great family event that brings out folks. So we decided to, to move forward with planning around that. Um, and then the, another series that uh, we decided to move forward with um, in terms of planning uh, was our Dinner Under the Stars, which has been going on for about four years. Um, it's what we call our Al Fresco Dining Series. Um, it's located on another street in Bloomfield Center where we have outdoor tables set up uh, and in conjunction with the restaurants located on that street. Uh, we provide uh, just a nice, uh, a pleasant environment for people to listen to live music uh, that we provide um, and enjoy a few hours under the stars uh, of dining. Um, under the stars. Uh, so as we began looking at those two events, uh, it was clear that we had to put in place certain protocols. Um, and we felt it was very uh, important for us in marketing and promoting the event that uh, people see that we, we did so in a way that we had public safety first and foremost. So one of the things that you know we were not used to doing, but we quickly had to adjust and, and, and put in place was signage. And you see some pictures there of some of the signage uh, that we created. Uh, these are signs that we put um, both on, on the two streets uh, where we have uh, these events taking place, uh, reminding people that masks have to be worn um, while on the, on the site, uh, reminding people about social distancing. Um, you know, the other thing that we did was to make sure that uh, we regularly announced, um, you know, whether it be at our cruise nights through our DJ, uh, or from the performer performing at a dinner under the stars evening that, um, you know, reminding folks about social distancing and wearing masks and, and let's try to have fun, but let's do it safely and in consideration of everybody else around us. Um, now with cruise nights, we've had three different evenings. We unfortunately had a couple of rain outs. Uh, these are Wednesday evenings. Tonight is our last one, as a matter of fact. And with dinner under the stars, we've had two so far. Um, the turnout, one of the questions that we had in our mind is, okay, what kind of term, turnout are we going to see with these two events? Uh, cruise nights, you know, um, in previous summers would average around um, uh, 60 to 70 people coming through. Um, Dinner Under the Stars was even more. That's definitely our most popular uh, event. Um, that would average around uh, close to 100 people coming out to sit in these outdoor seats um, and enjoy music and, and good food. Um, you know, so the question was, how, what kind of appetite is there for people to be outside? How safe do people feel? Um, and it's not a surprise that we've noticed that the um, turnout of people has been a little bit depressed from previous summers. Um, we're probably averaging around uh, 40 to 50 people with cruise nights coming out. 
um, and probably around uh, the same uh, number with the uh, outdoor um, um, alfresco dining at Dinner Under the Stars. Um, other things that we put in place, though, to try to ins ensure and, and you know, make people more comfortable is, you know, uh, installing quarter johns. Prior to this summer, we did not have to worry about uh, having quarter johns um, because, you know, people would be able to freely go into local restaurants who opened their doors and allowed people to come in and out, you know, to use their facilities. That's not the case now. So uh, we um, provide a quarter of johns um, and, and, you know, with the ideas of, of seeing how much in use are they going to be? And we always put a um, disinfectant wipes right next to the Porta John uh, and with signage that uh, letting folks know to please use the, the, the wipes um, and, and consider the next person using it. Uh, the other thing we had to uh, make sure we do is uh, work very closely and ask the police. Um, at each of these events, we have police officers um, on the site, on site um, and ask them to help us police the whole question of mask wearing. Courtney joked around with the fact that, uh, you know, people tend not to, uh, you know, a, a lot of people, half people um, tend not to, you know, be as, as cognizant about wearing their mask and willing to wear their mask. And I certainly didn't want to put myself or my staff in a position to try to tell someone who comes on to, you know, on our event scene um, to enjoy themselves and do not have a, a mask. So, you know, we asked the police um, and they've been very gracious in helping us when they see someone coming on to Washington Street or Broad Street um, to, to remind folks that, you know, hey, if you're going to stay here, you need to, you know, wear a mask. Obviously, once you're sitting down and having dinner, you don't have to worry about it. But as you, if you're milling around um, in any way, shape or form, please uh, do us the courtesy of, of wearing masks. Um, we also had to think about minimizing the exchange of items between ourselves uh, and the public. Uh, as I'm sure all of you do, whenever you have an event, you have probably an information table where you're distributing literature, you're distributing menus um, and, and, and other items for your local businesses and promoting the area. Uh, we, we said we can't do that anymore. Um, and so for flyers and other things that we wanted folks to, to see, we decided to uh, put our flyers in these plastic display cases, uh, display stands that we would have on the table uh, with signage that says, if any of these um, flyers of upcoming events and activities look interesting, please take out your camera and, or your phone and take a picture and, and share it and keep it on your phones for future reference. Uh, in this way, we're not having people necessarily uh, feel like they have to take a flyer and, you know, in some respects, and some people may not be comfortable with that. Uh, the other thing with our car show, we normally would do trophies, you know, and have a best in show uh, trophy given to the, the most unique or interesting looking car for the evening. Uh, we did away with the uh, trophies this year and instead, what we did um, in order to help promote our um, small businesses, we instead gave the winning cars, um, the owners of the cars uh, that were chosen as the winners, uh, gift cards of $50 that we purchased. Um, and, you know, we announced uh, the winner. And, and that was also an opportunity to plug the local restaurant or business that the uh, gift card uh, was from. So, again, that was another area that we had to kind of pivot and make a change on. Um, the, the one thing that uh, we've tried to do, uh, the only thing that we'd like to try to do in terms of handing out any literature or any items from our information table at either of these events um, was hand sanitizers. Uh, we used to have these hand sanitizers that would have the Bloomfield Center logo. We thought, you know, what better thing to have that in handing out, you know, and promoting the organization and the area than these little um, bottles of hand sanitizers that people can put in there you know, purse or in the back pocket, loop onto their belt. Uh, unfortunately, um, the vendor, the two vendors that we've worked with in the past have said that they can't get their hands on any hand sanitizer, which I guess is a little bit of uh, understandable uh, considering the situation. But um, if there's anything that we wanted to, to try to distribute would be hand sanitizers, especially for an event like Dinner Under the Stars, uh, where you're having people eating at these local restaurants. Um, and, um, you know, they would have the hand sanitizer handy. Um, and then while using it, be, uh, see our logo and our website and be reminded that that's a source of uh, a place they can go to to find out, you know, things happening in and around uh, the downtown Bloomfield area. Um, so um, I think that's about all I, I will say right now um, for those two events. Cruise Nights ends tonight. Um, our Dinner Under the Stars uh, is going to go through to the end of September. 
We might even extend it to October. Again, we're kind of keeping an eye on how many people um, are, are attending this event. Those that are there are very grateful that we're trying and we're providing an opportunity uh, for an outdoor activity. Um, but uh, my sense is there are, are a lot of people uh, who are still very reticent and hesitant to come out and be outdoors, uh, even when you're trying to set up the venue and, in, and the event in a way that's safe uh, uh, for everybody. And so I guess I'll leave a, a question for the group. Um, you know, at some point we have to decide how many more of these events and how much longer we, we, do we want to do it if we don't see those numbers of attendees go up because it costs money, it takes time to put these events together, and you certainly don't want to be in a position where you're spending a lot of money for um, numbers of people that are not uh, bringing you uh, an adequate um, uh, return on your investment, return on your time and, and, and the resources you're spending. And uh, any organization out there that's looking to, you know, looking to do events, I think, you know, uh, gauging the, the level of interest and participation from the community uh, in relation to your budget and what you have um, is, a, is a big question you'll be faced with. And with that, I'll, I'll turn it over to Emily and uh, uh, who we worked with uh, on something here. Uh, or maybe I'll turn it back to Courtney so she can decide who goes next. Uh, thank you so much for your attention. Thank you, Olin. And no, you're right. Emily's, Emily's going to go next. I figure out how to keep the Bloomfield uh, uh, together. So thank you, Olin. I'm sure people are going to have questions and clarifications uh, at the end if you can stick around. Right. Hey, Emily. Hey. All right. Great. Um, so, so, so Olin um, talked about a couple of the events um, that they did um, in Bloomfield Center. Um, my name is Emily, by the way, I run EMI Strategy and I've worked with Bloomfield Center for the past couple of years. Um, last year we did uh, food tours with um, Bloomfield Center Alliance. This year um, we ran Bloomfield Center Restaurant Week. So, you know, going back to the early beginning of this year, we had planned to run kind of a traditional Restaurant Week event where you'd have a number of restaurants engaging with, um, you know, prefix meal specials, um, of course, indoor dining. Uh, we were thinking about indoor entertainment events. And um, of course, when the pandemic began, we had to pivot. Um, and Olin and I and their team had a lot of discussions about, do we just postpone all the way to the fall? Do we, um, basically, how do we decide when to have this restaurant week event? And it just seemed with the news coming out um, and just the constant change that you might postpone forever <laughs> if, if we don't um, choose to uh, reinvent, like the title of this you know, event, reinvent this event to fit the current reality. So there were just kind of three key points I wanted to make um, in my 10 minutes. Um, the first thing about, I think, reinventing events is to keep the focus on the businesses uh, and and center your reinvented event around the businesses. I think there's gonna be a lot of um, interest in creating outdoor events, of course. Um, and sometimes I think that ends up being um, a farmer's market or a maybe um, uh, some sort of flea market or even you know, um, maybe a, a distanced festival. And I think that, you know, all those things are fantastic. I know I've been shopping at farmer's markets, you know, this whole time because it's outdoors, but it, you do sometimes I think lose the focus on the business owners that are in your downtown when you start to look outside for vendors that can populate an outdoor event. And so I think, you know, in Bloomfield Center Restaurant Week, we had to make a, big, a lot of big changes, but the focus really stayed on the businesses that are in the downtown and that's important for us to keep in mind as people are looking for outdoor events uh, through this time. Um, the second thing that we did, um, which is different than maybe a regular restaurant week, was offer different opportunities for engagement um, for the on the customer side. So um, during a traditional restaurant week, you would have, um, you know, you would just really focus on in-person dining venues, right? Um, if you go to the website, we created um, Bloomfield Center restaurantweek.com. Um, that was one of the first uh, kind of action items for me was to create a place to put all this information. Um, we, and if you can kind of see a snapshot of it there, we actually linked 
to Grubhub, we linked to Uber Eats, we asked the restaurant owners, what are the, your favorite platforms? Some of them have ways that you can order directly online through their website, but some of the smaller businesses like to use um, these different platforms. We also um, wrote, and again, you can't quite see it there, but I, I do encourage you to go to the Bloomfield Center Restaurant Week.com. We wrote underneath each restaurant that was participating, um, limited outdoor seating, uh, outdoor seating, you know, or encourage, pickup, delivery, or all, you know, all four or three options. So we wanted to inform people that might be comfortable you know, have different levels of comfort. I know personally, I've only been doing takeout. I haven't sat outside at a restaurant yet, um, but you can still engage and support the businesses in your community. And we made it easy to do that by linking the phone number um, through the website, linking to the Uber Eats, linking to the Grubhub, linking to their website. So everything could be done um, right there on your phone. Um, and it didn't require a lot of going around. I think we tried to do a lot of that heavy lifting for people and, and really, you know, say you can still support the restaurant community at this time. This is a critical time actually to be supporting the restaurant community. Um, everyone's getting started again. They had to hire their staff again. They're um, buying ingredients for their food. So, you know, if you can support through ordering online and, and getting a delivery service, that's great. Um, and actually some of the restaurants that we've been assessing, um, I've been uh, making calls and emails to the restaurants that participate in restaurant week. They said, hey, like, my Uber Eats orders really went up that week. I'm like, that's, that's great. I think in the past, we wouldn't have seen that as something to encourage during a restaurant week, but we have to meet people where they are now. And some people just aren't going to go out to a restaurant and sit down, probably for several, like, like Courtney said in the beginning, for maybe the rest of the year. So we need to start encouraging people to engage with the restaurants in different ways. And so we did that through a website that had a lot of different ways to engage built into it and also promoting that um as part of the restaurant week we sent out a number of mailers um you know via bca's constant contact we had a sign up form that hundreds of people uh signed up on on the bloomfield center restaurant week website and we pushed out material saying you can engage with these restaurants in different ways try takeout try delivery um and we had pictures of you know, like Buco, which is focused there. Um, great restaurant in downtown Bloomfield, probably one of my favorites. Um, they have, you know, they have very cute bags that you can go pick up. Another restaurant, um, Bloomfield Steakhouse, Bloomfield Steak and Seafood, they had to-go boxes called thank you boxes. Um, so we showed pictures of those takeout boxes on the social media in these mailers to, again, encourage people, show them that it's cute. Uh, we showed pictures on social media of people eating burgers from these restaurants on their balconies in the park to make it cool to get delivery and eat at home um, as well as outside of course so um, I think you know I think that's important to know and we also you know focus on all different businesses because we are allowing businesses to engage in different ways and and I'll talk about that in just a second um, you had more businesses engaged so we want the customer to be able to engage in different ways and then you want the restaurants to be able to. So the third, my first point is to center on the businesses. Second is to offer options for engagement for the customers. And my third point, just to be flexible with the restaurant owners. So again, you know, and most people, when you think restaurant week, it's okay, give us a prefix menu option. Um, and we will promote that, you know, to the uh, members of the business improvement district, to members of the community. Here, we were, it was a different email outreach that I did to the restaurants. It was, do you have any current specials that you would like us to promote uh, during this week in all of our press and all of our um, emails and website content? So, you know, just as an example, you know, um, La Santa, which is a picture of the outdoor dining uh, focused here, they actually are a little bit outside the main kind of, um, busiest part of Bloomfield Center, which is kind of centered around Washington Street and uh, an area called the kind of the Six Points. So this is a little bit further up Bloomfield Avenue. And this is a restaurant, it's a Colombian restaurant. Uh, they hadn't engaged a lot in Bloomfield Center events in the past, um, but we really did a, we'll meet you where you are kind of approach um, and we're flexible with how they and many other restaurants got engaged. 
that allowed them to participate. And they had a fantastic week. Um, I talked to their manager, Christian, and, and they had a wonderful week. This is just like, this is probably, I think this was a Wednesday night. I went around and took pictures of some of the different restaurants in the community. Um, and they just had a lunch special menu that they'd already been promoting. And we didn't force them to create a brand new dinner menu. We just said, okay, great. You have this lunch special menu. Um, this is what you want us to promote. Okay, we'll put it on social media. We'll link to it on the website. And they were able to engage um, in that way. So I think being flexible, this is a tough time for the restaurants. I don't need to tell you know, all of you that. Um, you know, I'm sure you're talking to your restaurant owners. It's, it's hard, all the PPE and the new rules and only being able to have outdoor dining. Um, I think we want to support them in a way that makes sense for them. And if, if they have um, a special item that they wanted, like some of the places, to be honest, there's a couple of really small businesses and they just said, well, this is everyone's favorite meal. I'd love if you could share, you know, pictures of this favorite meal online. We had uh, um, a Jamaican restaurant that had oxtails and said, okay, we'll share the pictures of it. We'll say this is the customer's favorite. I mean, so that was on the real uh, kind of very flexible end of the spectrum of just just tell us your favorite meal and then we did have about four or five restaurants that created special restaurant week menus that we'd be more familiar with i think those businesses that did create the special menus and put that effort in had uh, the best returns but i think having the other restaurants involved um you know gave them new exposure that they wouldn't have had otherwise and it just allowed us to have a broader range of restaurants participate in these kind of challenging times the last picture that um, I was going to talk about um, is just, we did create a series of small videos, really short, um, really kind of low budget iPhone slicing videos um, of different business owners in the community to, again, just kind of center the businesses and give them a little extra promotion um, during this time. And then all of those lived on the Bloomfield Center Restaurant Week website. So people could get a little snapshot of who they were doing business with. It was all about the entrepreneurs, um, that their families, their connection to Bloomfield Center. And I think that, that kind of personal attention and personal connection is just an added value that we could provide um, during these times. So, so those are kind of the, the, the three things I want to talk about when we're reinventing events. Great. Thank you very much, Emily. Um, next, we're going to move on to uh, Wildwood Bid and what they're doing and John sent me a lot of photos and that'll be on when he's speaking but I did also uh, from their website and one of the reasons I asked John is they're doing um, a plethora of things I did want to share their flyer that's up that caught my attention um, so you know they have weekly things they're still going to the farmers market they're programming boot camps fitness yoga etc and then this whole second list of all the concerts and the movies and the art and the sip and shop and all of that uh, so I just so they 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 are they are still going strong with events. Um, so without further ado, here's some images of the events, and I'll let John tell you more about how it's going. Thanks, Courtney. Good morning, everybody. How's everybody doing? Everybody feeling good? Unmute yes. so I can hear you because I can't <laughs> stand these Zoom meetings without hearing yeah. people. Doing great. Doing good. All right. Good. good, good. So I, uh, I'm glad that we all could get together. Um, I'm not going to use the following phrases. Unprecedented times. I'm not going to say the words. What else am I not going to? I'm not going to say trying times. And I am definitely not ever going to say the word COVID. Don't do that. Stop saying it. Don't put it on Facebook. Don't put it in print. Erase it from your mind. All right, drop my phone. Where are we now, Courtney? Can you put up the first slide, please? Uh-oh, I can't hear you. Uh, it's a bunch of the pictures. I didn't create a slide for each picture, so I just can't create a kind of a montage of all the different oh, cool. things you're all doing. Right, I wanna see what you're seeing. All right, cool. I see it. All right, so we have something in our favor that has been helping us out a lot. Um, if you look at that picture on the very far right, that is Burn Plaza. Uh, those four or five photos that you see there, that's, that's our crowning achievement uh, for our downtown. So that's the engine that's been driving 
um, everything that we've been doing downtown for the last few years. Uh, we broke ground on that a few years ago, um, and we're pretty proud of it. So that's what's been helping us do a lot of outdoor events that have been driving business to our downtown uh, merchants and restaurants. Um, the bar owners, the restaurant owners, the merchants are all very, very thrilled with everything we've been doing. Um, so I don't know, uh, Courtney, if you want me to just go over a few quick things about some of the things we've been doing, or did you ra would you rather I just stick to how we're doing things operationally? Uh, both. Both is great. All right. So these are mainstay events and activities that we've been doing every year now for the last few years. We do a Monday, Wednesday, and Friday morning boot camp exercise, uh, socially distanced this year, obviously. That's been very popular, and we have enough room to... Um, suitably spread out a lot of people. Um, we also do a fitness uh, yoga yoga in the plaza Tuesdays and Thursday mornings. That's been getting a lot of buzz too and has been really picking up steam. Every Tuesday night we do a free movie night, family movie. It's like a Disney type of movie every Thursday night at, at uh, dusk. That's always super popular. Um, again, we have just enough of a crowd this year that we can spread them out very easily. Um, the free concerts we do, um, if you think of any of your favorite bands that you might have um, been around down the shore, whether it's Sea Isle or Wildwood or any of your favorite shore towns down here, we have them all, um, including like the Giuliano Brothers, um, Stellar Mojo. So these bands have big, big followings. Now, we're lucky enough to have a pretty big budget. Um, to pay for them, that, but that they draw big crowds. Now, those concerts, we have had to have uh, volunteers and paid staff to make sure that people are socially distanced, and we just stick it with family members. Like, in other words, if we can tell it's a family group, we just make sure they're six feet apart from other families. We, we've been doing it with a six-foot jump rope. Just, like, quickly measure it and move on, and we do it in a friendly way, and we have kind of fun do wildwood masks that our staff wears if they get a little bit too close to another family, just to mention to them. So we always try to keep it fun. That's the one thing I want to tell you guys. Keep it fun with a smile on your face. And that kind of gets the point across without people getting upset because everybody's on edge. Um, still, you still get some people that are just not going to put up with it. They're not going to listen to you. Um, you just have to smile through it, right? So. The other things we're doing, uh, the, the last couple of years, we've introduced orchestras, like uh, classical orchestras, uh, jazz orchestras. That's not something that you would normally equate with Wildwood. I have to tell you, it's been a huge success. We're getting a lot of locals that are coming to these concerts from Cape May, from Stone Harbor, from Avalon. These are, these are customers that we never had before. And that's really been helping out uh, a lot of our merchants, especially the women's boutiques that have opened up in the last two years. They're seeing a huge uptick in sales due to these, uh, these orchestra concerts and, and all these other events. Um, we started a shit, uh, sip, shop, and stroll, which is like wine, tasting, art vendors, and music. Again, not something you'd equate with Wildwood. Uh, I like to say we're not your father's Wildwood anymore. We're getting a lot of new customers through our paid Facebook ads through um, I have to stress video do video as much as you can um, you don't have to pay to do video on Facebook do it trust me you're gonna get way more traction with videos than keep them a minute or shorter you're gonna get a ton of traction more than a still photo on Facebook or Instagram trust me on that um, so that those are those are the kind of things we've been doing I could go on and on I don't want to bore you with everything but again try to keep it fun um, communicate with your business people I can't stress that enough communicate with your end result always being in mind is this helping the business person because if it isn't scrap it so when uh, Olin had mentioned you know we have to uh, figure out hey um, you know, we have to figure out, is this event worth sustaining anymore, you know, for financially? Um, you know, sometimes you got to move forward and move on. But I would say designate someone to keep in weekly or biweekly contact with all your frontline business people in your downtown and ask them. 
Don't ask, don't do any, don't do it any other way. Ask them face to face. I myself, I'll leave the motel. I'm in one of the motel rooms right now, downtown. And I'll just walk around the corner to Pacific Avenue. I'll just go, if I, once we're slow in the afternoon and, and the, the work of the day is done, um, I'll spend an evening downtown just rapping with these guys, like what's working, what's not working, tell me. I, I don't, don't have an ego about your events. Don't ever have an ego about your events. Because I know sometimes people get very possessive about the events they create and they don't want to let go. But if they're not working, and what I mean by working is, yes, you can have a huge crowd for an event. But if it's only helping your vendors that are there for the day and your food truck vendors, you're not helping your downtown enough. Uh, food trucks are not the enemy to the restaurant. If it's done correctly, it's the overflow crowds, especially if it's nice weather, are going to end up in your restaurants without question. But don't make it what I call a self-fulfilling event, meaning it's just a circle. It's just feeding the event and not the small businesses. So that, if there's anything I can leave you guys with, it's always make sure that your, uh, your end result in mind is how are we helping the small businesses around our events, period. Um, what else did I want to tell you? Um, let me see. I want, I want to say one thing, Emily, if you reach out to Emily, and I'm not getting paid to say this, reach out to Emily and do one of her events that has to do with the uh, restaurant um, sampling. I attended one and it was outstanding. And I don't normally say things like that about some of these things I go to. Uh, thanks, John. <laughs> um, let me see, what else do I have to tell you guys? Always approach downtown events. Yeah, okay. Sometimes, ba, ba, ba. yeah, that's pretty much it. So. Um, I want to thank Courtney, and I want to tell you that I'll, I'll remain on the call to field any questions you guys have. We're having a huge amount of success. We are also a drive-in market, though, and we have a lot of outdoor motels that you don't have to be indoors to get to in any way. You, uh, most of the motels are doing contactless check-in, um, and it's exterior corridor. My hotels and motels are exterior corridor, so you do not... All of our rooms are completely sanitized and all of the motels are pretty much following the same protocol. So we're having a lot, we're getting a lot more business, uh, business from drive-in businesses from New York and Philly that are coming here for the summer. So we're very fortunate. I know you guys are in a completely different situation. So you can't equate what we're doing and I don't expect to. Uh, I know we're very fortunate. I don't take it for granted. Um, so I know some of these things you guys just, it won't translate to your community, but some of these things you guys can do, like the video, um, pay, uh, unpaid video ads on Facebook and keeping it, keeping it happy and light. Those are two things. And, and staying in contact with your business people, asking them what's working and not working. That's all I got. Thank you, John. And I'm going to take moderator prerogative here. And I have a follow-up question for you while it's tip of my mind. Um, how are you handling lo the logistics of the sip and paint? Because that seems very hand on hands on um sure. and yeah how they handle, uh, well, handling we're, we're, it's not a sip and paint so maybe no, i didn't it's a explain sip and it stroll yes that's what i meant the sip and stroll it's a sip well let, let me uh, so the plastic we're, they're handed plastic cups to sip we have plenty of trash cans and recycling cans all around the plaza and it's really more of a, a socially distanced art expo and i don't want to say a craft show because it's not a one of those crappy craft shows it's you can purchase the art, uh, and then we have a, like a, we have a guy playing jazz guitar up on this up on our plaza stage. That's really all it is. Okay. Oh, see, I was envisioning it was actually going down the the street, and that that would, would be hard. But yeah, it's in the plaza, no, so you can yeah. space things out. Got yeah, and, then, and like I said, we have, we're lucky enough that we have a we have a bunch of nice stores across the street and restaurants, a bookstore, an ice cream parlor, a ladies boutique. Um, a lot of nice places to sit and eat outside that face the plaza. So we're very fortunate that all those guests, they, they do, and I've been there to these events. They just, as soon as the event's over or during the event, they just kind of meander around the street and purchase, you know, they, they spend. They're spending, definitely. Great, great. And I know, um, so I know some of, some of you have sent me questions by email and that's just a standard uh, thing in um, Zoom that says send me questions ahead of time. Please feel free to, uh, you know, unmute yourself and, and ask those questions uh, in real life here. And, you know, it can 
John, Olin, or Emily, or if there's somebody else who I know Pam's doing some events too, and others who are doing events want to chime in and answer people's questions, that's great. So uh, Danielle, I think you had one, right? Yes, I actually did. Um, I just wanted to see how other towns were dealing with paying for a lot of the events. Like our town has supported us for, we had some Denville After Dark events where we had some live music and some high top tables, everything was socially distanced. Um, but we've now been told that the DPW and police costs are going to be put onto us because the town just couldn't afford to pay for it anymore. I didn't know if how much support other bids get from their town as far as covering the that kind of stuff for their events. Owen, I mean, what's oh go ahead. Oh go ahead, go ahead, Owen. I talked enough. <laughs> <laughs> No, because I know Olin's is in the street, so there's probably yeah. some. Yeah, uh, thanks so much. So in, in our case, um, we've, we've always paid for our security. We've always uh, paid for the tables that we bring in for Dinner Under the Stars. So that was something that was already baked into our budget. Um, it wasn't a cost that the uh, township previous to this year, this summer, uh, paid out of, their, out of their own pocket. So. Um, you know, it, it's, it, it was just the cost of doing our events um, from, you know, from, you know, the very start. So, so we're not really uh, hit with the reality of, oh my goodness, now we have these additional costs because of this uh, whole situation and, and, uh, and the township not covering certain costs. So I don't know if John has a different experience there in, uh, in Wildwood. Did we actually paying for our own that the event related stuff but because of having to hard target to close in the street that's where we're running into problems with the town now they said well we'll pay for the first two but the next two the overtime for dpw because usually evening events and all of the hard targeting of bringing the, the dump trucks and everything to block the streets that's where we're having an issue with our town um yeah that's that's a tough one we so the way we closed, we closed down three blocks of Pacific Avenue about a month ago. Uh, my recommendation was, let's just do it Friday, Saturday, and Sunday nights with temporary police blockades. But the chief of police kind of said it for safety reasons, whether somebody's texting and not paying attention or God forbid something more uh, dangerous, uh, we had to use concrete barriers and close it down permanently until the after Labor Day. That bothered some of the business owners who, in my opinion, aren't really seeing the big picture. They're older guys and older ladies and gentlemen who maybe are just set in their ways and don't realize that a lot of that foot traffic traffic is going to help them. Um, I just know that from the restaurants and some of the boutique owners that it's helped them. Um, we didn't have to chip in for that. Uh, that was something that Wildwood Public Works uh, just did. It really wasn't expensive. They already had the barriers and the forklift and just placed them down okay. and it was over. Um, but we dressed them up with planners and signage that was really branded to uh, our downtown to make it look nicer. So it wasn't just like a war zone with a concrete barrier there. <laughs> um, so yeah, and that was a big help. Uh, Krista Fitzsimmons is one of our newest uh, council people. We call them commissioners. Um, and she was a big help with that. And uh, the city's been very supportive. I, I can't, I can't deny that. But we have a pretty big budget too for a bid. Yeah. Uh, so it's not, it's not a fair comparison either. Because we're kind of small, and we would have to ourselves as the bid purchase those concrete barriers and then oh, pay the DPW yeah. to have it moved and move around. And we have a very small downtown, so we could never leave it permanently blocked. So it would require each time we do it move everything in yeah. and out. So we're just like, I like what you guys were saying about making sure that the cost, you know, in the event is paying for itself basically and what you're getting out of a return. So this is something right. I need to just see what other towns are doing. Cause I don't know if this is normal for our town or this is just what everybody else is dealing with. So I I can, there's I also a, uh, pro I'm sorry, go ahead. So just, just very quickly, like, like John, you know, we've been lucky in Bloomfield in that you know, the administration from several weeks ago made it very clear that they wanted to be an active, actively helping and targeting restaurants because as Emily pointed out, restaurants is probably one of the more important, you know, small businesses to really try to kickstart your, your downtown community. Everyone wants to eat, everyone wants to, in, in, you know, experience good food. 
Um, and they did uh, set up these barriers, permanent barriers around uh, down one of the streets where we have our dinner under the stars. Um, so part of the street is blocked off, almost like a parklet set up. And, um, you know, so those restaurants now have, you know, plenty of outdoor seating. We bring in additional tables that we pay for out of our budget. Um, but, you know, the fact that the township has done this in several places around not only the downtown, but the, the broader township speaks to, you know, their assistance and their support um, in really helping, you know, um, downtown restaurants and restaurants in general, um, you know, um, you know, get off the ground and, and, and survive this, this time. And then they uh, block off the street, Washington Street, which is where our Dinner in the Stars takes place. They block the street with police cars and barriers. We pay for that time that those officers that set up uh, those evenings. But again, that's already part of our budget. We, they give us a reduced rate, you know, compared to what they would charge you know, anybody else needing, needing to block off the street. But we still pay for that, uh, that time and, and those police cars stationed, you know, at our event locations to block off the street. That's helpful, because then that is sort of what our town is kind of asking us for, so then that is something normal. Okay, thank you. I'm just gonna jump in here, Pam from New Brunswick. So initially when we wanted to have the roads closed, uh, we were informed, and in the past, anytime we had an event like yourself, we would have to cover the cost of the police and the barriers, pay the DPW, et cetera. What happened was we were looking to close a main roadway and a partial closure of another main road. Um, the police chimed in and said, since our organization and volunteers do not have the safety experience that would be needed, the police indicated that the city would take over. The DPW then dropped off the barriers at each of the corners where the road would be closed. We can't close our roads from Thursday through Sunday, we have to open them up every evening. So the police and the restaurant owners and staff themselves help to close the roads. The, my understanding is the municipality applied for a grant, some kind of a COVID grant, that's helping them cover the cost of the police through November 20th. So we're able to close the roads Thursday through Sunday through November 20th for an executive order that the um, mayor released. So that has helped us substantially. And with the money that we would have allocated towards other events that are not taking place, we are covering the cost of musicians. So in front of each, so we, our side streets are open. So we have one main drag, which is George Street. All of our side streets have, uh, pass through access. But in front of each of those blocks, we have a performer stationed Thursday, Friday, Saturday, and Sunday. So that there's different types of music going on, which has helped to drive um, more people to uh, the restaurants where normally, you know, New Brunswick is dead usually in the summertime. Uh, the school isn't in. The hotels that we have are not open. A lot of the uh, Johnson & Johnson is a main uh, corporation here. Uh, they have not returned to full staff yet, as well as a lot of our office staff, our office buildings. So we don't necessarily have the employees that we would normally serve. We're actually getting more residents out and people coming because their towns don't have anything like this. So we're finding that we're attracting from outside because of the music. So that's how we're working our funding. It sounds to me, uh, you know, I've seen, you know, clearly I follow articles as they pop up. I know Montclair is also doing the partnership and they're, they're uh, doing the cost of the shutdown. And then the bid is doing like helping with tables and planters and making it pretty. Um, and I think um, Jersey City did the same thing. And Jersey City specifically did it from a, an insurance liability standpoint. Um, so that the insurance goes through them and it doesn't have to be the bid that has to cover whatever it is. Uh, so that's why they were taking the lead. So, um, you know, I think it is kind of a mixed bag all over the place, but there's examples on both, both ends of it um, happening. Um, let's see, Abby, I know you had 
email me and then Robin will get to your question after that. Abby, you want to ask your question? You there? There you go. Hi, sorry. <laughs> Hi, uh, Abby Gailey from uh, Medford, New Jersey. Uh, we are, so we have a, a number of Main Street festivals that have obviously been canceled and we're looking for a way to really do a, a boom for the holidays. Um, so we're trying to launch a gift card program and we don't have a bid to fall back on. We do not have anything like that. We just have a business association that we run through and we've also approached the town about it. So I was just wondering if anybody has like a gift card um, promotion or a company that handles, you know, the, the logistics of a town wide gift card. So uh, how people get paid back, how people, um, you know, as far as we know, we, we were looking at Collingswood and Haddonfield. I don't know if there's anybody from here. I know they're both uh, bid districts, but they um, take, the, take the gift cash as money, give back money as change, and then they take their money to their town hall for a reimbursement. Um, and I, we were just looking to see if there was anything that might be uh, similar to that. We can't really get town hall on, on board from the sounds of it. So I'm just looking for any ideas or um, companies, if anyone uses any, that they could suggest. So I know that Pompton Lakes does it, but they, they do have a bid and they have, um, I think they call them bid bucks. Um, I think they, I, I don't know what they, what they look like, or I think they just print them up. And then the vendors, um, when they get them, will go to the bid. So, th so they're purchased by, from the bid by the people and they hold on to that money and I'm sure they have a separate bank account or whatever for that. And then the vendors every so often submit the bid bucks and they get reimbursed. That's how I know they do it. Um, I don't think they use a vendor. They handle it all in-house. Um, I don't know. Does anyone know of vendors who, who do that? <clears throat> I, uh, the only thing I recently heard of, and I actually just, I'm kind of a nerd, so I watch CBS in the morning, uh, Sunday morning, and they had a really nice piece on oh, a yeah. town in Washington called Tonino. And they have a, this was something they did during the Depression. Uh, when money was way tighter than it is now. And they just started printing their own money. I'm gonna show you a picture of it, if you could see that. This is the guy, and he prints, he has the actual Depression era printer. Now, I'm not saying that you can do that, but those are, that's the money that they actually print. I don't know if you could see it. And um, what they do is that they, they make each individual one out of like almost a pulp paper. I know this is elaborate and you may not be able to do it, but on the cheap, you could probably do something where you put an individual serial number on each one of them so that they, so that people can't just print these things out at home. It's actually something I'm trying to find out if I can recreate downtown here to encourage more uh, dollars staying in the community. Um, it's a pretty old idea and it's not a bad one. Yeah. Yeah, no, that's really neat. Yeah. Metuchen um, they used a company called Giftly. I don't have any connection to it or know how successful that is. Um, but you can look on there. You can, if you Google Metuchen Giftly, um, it seems like it's a way that you can make gift cards for people that don't have gift cards, which is a problem in a lot of the downtowns where some businesses have the gift cards to be purchased, some don't. Um, so you can look at that. And then I'm also going to drop in the chat, um, I actually just wrote for downtown New Jersey's last newsletter, something on uh, gift cards. We featured Vineland um, and also Fort Lee that have different gift card programs. And you know, um, it's possible to maybe follow up with those two individuals on how they did it. I know in Vineland, they actually had a bank sponsor um, the purchase of the gift cards, which, uh, which might be an option if you know, the town isn't involved or the, there's not a bid to be involved. So I'll put that right here. And Jennifer Auer also put in the, the chat that you can apparently buy a cereal stamper on Amazon. So there you go. There you go. Um, let's see, uh, Robin, I know you had a, had a question. You want to, are you still here? Yeah, you are. There you go. I think I'm unmuted. Yes. So so my question, we're, we are highly um, required to only have 500 people, which is for some events that would have been a good crowd and for other events that makes it not worth doing at all. Um, right now, 500 people who are 
coming to uh, enjoy Flemington and then also, you know, may, see the businesses and um, buy something from the businesses would be a, a boost. But um, because we have to count each person, and that includes any vendors or shop owners, um, we're being required to fence in the entire area and have like one exit in, one exit out. We're being required to have a accounting ticketing system to know, you know, to try to aid with knowing how many people are showing up. Um, and all that just is really cost prohibitive. So I'm wondering if other people are, um, you know, doing events and finding that 500 people are coming, or is that, a, is that, you know, is it reasonable to ex to expect um, a crowd of 500 people these days? And uh, my other question is really about ticketing methods or counting methods, and and the last thing is about uh, public restrooms and if if people are getting porta potties and hand washing stations. Um, so that those are my questions for the group. Robin, I just have a couple of clarification questions before people sure. chime in. Is this an actual like planned event or is it more like just closing the streets and we're, having people walk around? Do you know what I mean? Yeah, we're not, we're um, closing the street means having only 500 people. In their opinion. And, Therefore, there those things are uh, mutually connected to each other. So, even if I s just had a little bit of music and we chose to close the street, we can only if it, if we're calling it an event, we are only allowed to have 500 people, and therefore we have to count. <clears throat> I think that is the tipping point between being able to do this uh, casually or or having everything be very expensive. My opinion is it so, sounds like their definition of an event is is a little too strict, but did somebody else want to chime in? So something uh, we're doing on Main Street in Medford, our street is remaining open for this, but we have a monthly food truck festival and the police did have the question of are we going to over like go over the, the limit of outdoor event capacity. Our Main Street is only about three blocks long and we're not a very large main street um and we take what we did was we take 10 food trucks we spread them out among the street all the businesses stay open and we have like random um coordinated specials but each individual truck is considered its own event so as long as people are maintaining social distance on the sidewalk wearing their masks etc then we don't have a it's not a one group event it's each truck having their own event so that's how we got around that whole you know, capacity of how many people are expected to be there. Um, and it's been working. We've had three since July 1st. Pam, do you have anything? Because you guys are climbing off the street and clearly you're getting some some people there. Are they making you count or anything? No, because we're doing it casually, but it's uh, this morning I had an events committee meeting and we were looking at create, you know, we're not going to be having an Oktoberfest in the fall. So, um, we were looking at creating either a summer fest or a fall fest um, and doing what we're doing now where it's block to block, it's, it's closed with the intersections passing by. And we do not have, you know, like for some events, uh, the entire area would need to be um, barricaded. Right now we're only using a barricade at the intersections of each of the streets. So if someone wanted to get up and walk out with a, uh, a drink in their hand, um, they could go and cross, you know, the street and go into the next section to listen to another band. So the, the police are being very lenient. We've not had the conversation yet as to if we did create and try to promote enhancement of what we're currently doing by having a summer fest, all we would be doing is adding an arts component or maybe an ice cream truck component or theming it somehow and, and adding some small components to it. Maybe we had a, um, a farmer's market component in the fall uh, and, and things like that. Uh, so it's interesting that, you know, if, you, if you're calling it an event, 
how does that change the dynamic? So yeah. um, I think that's something that we're going to have to be aware of going forward. But we're, I mean, we haven't counted. I think if, you know, if we counted all of the restaurants that are doing outdoor dining, not on one road, uh, we probably would exceed 500, but it's not one open area. Right. It's each restaurant or restaurants are, are broken up into designations. So I'd be curious to hear, um, was it Flemington? Where, yes. yeah, so is it, are you looking to just close one large area? Or yeah, it, we're, we're, so we're, right now we're being very clever and having a, a, you know, chill out on Main Street every Saturday afternoon uh, where we're not closing the streets and we're not really calling it in a, it's a, like a passive event. But if we want to have Thursday night, uh, music in the street we would have to close the streets and we would have to count and we would have to corral everything and it, it's really impossible to do that um, it's really difficult to do that but I guess my question is are people seeing more than are they seeing are you seeing close to 500 people uh, when you're having these happenings are people coming out People are coming out. I wouldn't say that there's, you know, a mass of 500 people in one designated area. Um, but people are coming out. Like I said, New Brunswick in general is slow during the summer, but we are seeing more people come out now than we've probably seen in the past. We would normally be um, within our restaurant week promotion, um, but the restaurants have indicated that they're seeing more people coming out and dining in the street, uh, but we're not seeing um, we're not seeing you know loads of people. The other thing is we're asking the restaurants to be very conscious that people are being seated when they're served. Um, in the beginning, there we did have one area um, designated. They had a what they considered a hostess welcoming area but it was actually a rollout bar. So people were actually coming up and drinking at the bar. Um, so we had to make sure that uh, we did have a discussion with them because people were not socially distancing themselves. They weren't wearing the masks because they were in groups of you know, their own friends. But in the, in, for the most part, everybody is seated. We're not serving anyone that's standing. So, so that's a so I'll just chime in very quickly from Bloomfield Center's um, perspective. Uh, no, we're not seeing the kind of uh, numbers of people that we've ha we have in the past. Um, you know, I think I shared some numbers earlier with our cruise night car show, um, which you know, in terms of spectators, you know, average around 40 to 50 people, not including the car owners themselves and their guests, um, and also Dinner in the Stars just haven't produced anywhere close to 500 people. I think in terms of total diners in the you know, between the two shows we've seen, uh, we're maybe you know approaching seventy to eighty people. So uh, we're hoping that those numbers, especially with dinner under the stars, which will continue through the rest of the summer, will will increase slowly but surely. But uh, our sense is that there's still a good portion of the community that's not comfortable with outdoor. Uh, dining with being outdoors at these kinds of events. Uh, I'll also share that we tried another event, uh, an outdoor concert with uh, Bloomfield College, something that we've never, we had never tried before, but we said, let's, let's give it a try because we had this connection with the college. Um, and we scheduled it for July 4th thinking, hey, you know, in this environment, are there going to be a lot of people going down to the shore on July 4th? Um, to, to spend the holiday. So we took a chance, we scheduled it for that Saturday. Uh, we had a big barbecue where people can come and get ribs and corn, you know, corn on the cob and, you know, uh, bring, bring their, you know, uh, wine or beer or whatever and sit out in the middle of the college campus's quad. Um, with that particular event, you, because we did want to have a control or a sense of an, a, a, an idea of how many people would come out, we did require that people pre-register through Eventbrite. So we uh, um, promoted it and marketed, marketed it using Eventbrite. We actually had 100 people say they were uh, interested in coming 
Um, and we were very excited um, because we thought, well, you know, 100 people is, is a decent, it's, it's not a very big quad, so 100 people would have been, would have been a nice, a controllable number. Uh, unfortunately, that, that number did not actually materialize. It was a lot less than we had expected, but Eventbrite was a, a great platform in that you're collecting people's names and email addresses. You're able to get people to pre-register and, and hopefully uh, give you a sense as to how much interest there is. So if you're looking for a way to kind of, you know, pre-sell tickets or, or in other ways, you know, register folks, uh, you might want to look at Eventbrite as, a, as the platform. Uh, the other thing that we've done that I didn't mention, um, you know, during my uh, 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 preliminary remarks is we do have sanitizing stations, um, you know, in that we have uh, disinfectant wipes and hand sanitizer stations at all of our events with plenty of signage uh, encouraging people to, to, to take it. So, um, you know, uh, we're, we're just not seeing anywhere close to the 500 people that your town is requiring you to, to, to meet. So I find that a little, little ambitious, but, uh, you know, we, we, we're not faced with that challenge uh, in Bloomfield. Olin, for your car shows or, or the restaurant week, was there anybody kind of standing and, and counting as people were going in or was it kind of more of an eyeball and there was no policing that? Yeah, it's more of an eyeball. Uh, again, because the numbers never approached anywhere where we had to be concerned uh, about, you know, wow, there's a lot of people on this one block. Uh, it, it never became a, 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 an issue of, okay, we got to get a count and start controlling that. Um, it's definitely more of an eyeball estimate. Yeah. Robin, it really sounds like your police are being a little overly zealous on, on this, particularly like if, if you're already closing down the streets, just because you're adding music doesn't make it, you know, an event, <laughs> you know, if you were actually doing a full-on festival with vendors and trucks and it's fine, but this is definitely different. I, yeah. I agree. I think we, I think, and we're, we're lucky we have, we've had the high quality problem of, you know, planning for a thousand and getting 5,000. So I think, I think the police are just nervous that, um, you know, that, that uh, we serve a large, as a, we're the downtown that serves a very large area. Um, and since other people aren't having events, I think they're just afraid we'll get a lot of people interested, so. But thank you, that's really helpful. I appreciate everybody's input. And we, I will go back to the drawing table and see if we can uh, <laughs> come to different terms. Yeah, let us know if we can support in any way, basically, based off of, and maybe we need to, to have clarification from the governor's office. Although, although if you ask, they might make it too stringent and it would hurt other people, so maybe you don't want clarification. Um, right. Yeah, but if you need help with, with, we can gather some stories and anecdotes of what other people are doing, so maybe to calm them down a little bit. Um, I, it looks like- That's very helpful, really nope, helpful. No problem. Uh, Danielle, you had a question about um, a, a restaurant week guide, whether it's actually worth the cost of, of, of printing and design or, or stay online. Looking yeah, for Emily's after, thoughts on that? Yeah, after Olin's good point about not people not maybe wanting to take guides and do that kind of thing. I don't know. It's expensive for the design and printing of that. And I really looked at Emily's thing real quick while we were on and it looks really good. I don't know if maybe that's sufficient and maybe would be better than doing an actual guide. Yeah, so um, this was the first year that I was involved with, um, and actually the first year that Bloomfield Center had their own restaurant week. So in the past, there was something called Bloomfield Restaurant Week, which was townwide, that um, had been a number of uh, volunteer organizers um, working with the town of Bloomfield, um, a blogger who's fantastic and helped us a lot share information about Bloomfield Center Restaurant Week, um, Maria Probst from Bloomfield Pulse. So um, there had been this volunteer committee before for Bloomfield Restaurant Week, and I think they had done a lot more of um, a traditional restaurant guide um, and, you know, a professional photographer taking pictures of the food. And yeah, we just went a completely different direction this year um, because I think part of like having the restaurant guide is like you would have people maybe handing it out in advance uh, at the restaurants you know, maybe it'd be sitting right like on a table inside the restaurants or, and that all those things just, just aren't happening anymore. Um, so, so yeah, we found the online, you know, great. And, 
and uh, I, what I liked about it is on that website, we had like a pop up and it collected people's, um, you know, names and email addresses. So then we had kind of almost like a sales funnel where we could take all those email addresses and send out updates. So we sent out updates before the week. We sent out an update the day before the week. We sent out an update in the middle of the week. So you could kind of just like capture um, in a way that like a paper copy, you couldn't capture information about who was taking it. So uh, yeah, mm -hmm. I think the online option, you know, um, is good. Um, and, uh, you know, but I don't have experience producing a restaurant guide before this, but I would say online is, is good and try to make it mobile optimized. That site is relatively mobile optimized so that people can, you know, just press from their phone and call the restaurant. Um, and that's important too. Is that something your company did, Emily? Yeah. Yep. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I like the idea that Olin had brought up too about instead of people taking pamphlets, he had just had, you know, a board. So maybe you could create a poster of the restaurant week that gets put on some community board and <laughs> people are encouraged to take pictures and maybe there's one of those little codes and that'll take them to the the website, you know, the landing page for the restaurant week. I think that's probably a great way to kind of handle that. Yeah, definitely uh, agree with that, Courtney. Like on any of that, if you are going to do any kind of a poster, and I would recommend this to restaurants, and I have recommended this to some of my restaurant owners that asked me for my advice, um, add a QR code to all of your print. It's cheap. It's easy. I do it at the hotel for the little video I do. It leads you right to a little video of like helpful tips. Um, it's, it's not that expensive, trust me. Yeah, and I'll just say we did create a flyer. We did have a paper flyer, um, but it just sat on the table during Dinner Under the Stars in a, in a plastic sheath. Um, we posted it, you know, on social media, but, but we weren't like actively handing it out for all in common. And yeah, nobody wants to take anything. <laughs> Go ahead, a lot of the, I'm sorry, a lot of the local restaurants have adopted that where they have just a stationary, uh, very wipeable card or piece of, you know, hard plastic that has just the QR code and hold, it, it just clearly says, hold your cell, you know, your mobile phone camera up to this QR code to see our menu. And then it just pops right up on your phone with a link and you just press it and it brings it right to their menu. Yeah, I was at a restaurant in Connecticut that was, they did not give out menus at all. They were, yeah. go on your phone. Um, yeah. But make sure you spell that out because a lot of people still don't know what that thing is. They, they see a QR code and they just don't even know what to do with it unless you spell it out for them. It has to be very clear. Right. Anyone else want to share an experience or have a question or are we getting ready to wrap it up here? I did put in, I know Jennifer put in um, uh, some information about, she does a, what is it, family fun? If you, I, I don't mind you doing a two sec, 10 second commercial, Jennifer, if you're, if you're willing to promote people's events and things, that's wonderful. Okay, I'll do 10 second commercials. So um, Jersey Family Fun, online resource to, um, that we promote, you know, pretty much doing things and going out and doing events and activities with your kids and your family in New Jersey. So we do have a calendar event. It's normally, you know, it's very busy calendar events right now. It's not, but if you go to the website, jerseyfamilyfun.com under events, there's a drop down list um, or link, whatever, that will tell you how you can submit your events to be listed on our calendar events. So for the most part, there is no fee for that. Great. Thank you, Jennifer. And I do have, I put in the chat, um, we're looking for feedback on virtual conference, you know, kind of number of days, when, topics, etc. Please take the survey. We'd really appreciate it. It'll help us with our planning. Um, and the video and the summary uh, will be posted. I gave you the direct link uh, where that will be posted for this event uh, today. Um, if you want to look at that later. It normally takes, I normally get the videos up by three. It's a whole lot of processing between Zoom and YouTube to get them, get them ready. But so I really want to thank uh, John, Olin, and Emily. Uh, for leading our discussion and to everybody for participating and asking questions, sharing ideas. Um, oh, and one last thing. Um, I'm looking, there was an article that had five outdoor dining street closure highlighted five towns. I'd love to create a comprehensive 
list of the towns that are doing it with, and, and I can do a little slide picture. So you could send me 30 pictures if you want of all the great um, outdoor seating. So please, if you're doing something, just send me a paragraph blurb. And like, if you had to pass a resolution, I think ours is gonna be more of a resource for downtowns. Uh, just paragraph blurb with any links and as many pictures as you want. And I'm gonna create a website highlighting all the good stuff people are doing with outdoor um, accommodations for their businesses. So send that my way too. All right, thank you everybody. Uh, have a, it's, oh, it's only Wednesday, it's not a Friday. So it's not the weekend <laughs> yet. Um, but Thanks the Courtney, I have to run, but thank you guys. Thank you all. Take thank care. Everybody. This is so Thanks, helpful. Courtney. Thank you so much. Great. Bye. Bye-bye.